So an official welcome to Fostering Grief Readiness, a starter kit for mental health and school mental health leadership. We are in part one of our series. My name is Leora, she, hers. I'm the School Mental Health Field Director for the Pacific Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And I'm also someone who is a griever, a grief ally, as a manager, as a supervisor, a grief justice advocate and champion. Uh, and with you all in the hope and vision to center grief in our work culture, and not just trauma and not just uh, the silence around all of the sticky, harder things to talk about and feel and be. Uh, I'm here on Unceded Ohlone land in the Bay Area in California. I'm really grateful to be in community and conversation with all of you and to start our series together. We hope that all of you come for all four sessions. I want to be really clear that for me as a, as a teacher and facilitator, each session has its own gift and has its own particular scaffold. So you are, um, I, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about the series in a moment, but I'm glad that you're here right now in this moment. This whole series is actually a long compilation and buildup of many years of collaboration between three entities, ourself at the Pacific Southwest MHTTC, the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, many of you are familiar with Dr. David Schoenfeld at the NSCB, and an organization called Workplace Resilience, which centers um, grief in the workplace. And we came together in 2021 to bring school mental health leaders and mental health leaders from our region specifically. And we had a whole lab of like, what does grief ready even mean? And from that work, we created the starter kit, which all of you have, which we're, we'll be funding and fueling our conversation today. So the piece that I wanna name is that this content is both from you, field, field originated and also research originated. So it's community defined and evidence-based all together all together. We are in part one. Uh, how is it already March 5th, y'all? I just don't even know. We are in part one uh, and we'll be gathering every Tuesday in March uh, and doing a different part of the starter kit that our colleagues just put in the chat. So today we're gonna focus on grief readiness and on creating shared language. Part of one of the most central elements and tenets of being trauma-informed is creating shared language. So that when I say grief, or Ingrid says grief, or Ida says grief, or I say trauma, we at least know where we're coming at. It's a really foundational and necessary part of being grief-ready and grief-sensitive is being in shared language. We're gonna have a little bit of conversation around how grief is impacting our workforce. Um, you might have colleagues or managers or leaders that say, stop talking about grief, y'all, like it's not, it doesn't exist, it's not happening. And I'm gonna give you some stats about why it is, even though we know why it is. Um, and then we're gonna talk about why being grief ready is necessary in our school leadership and in our workforce leadership. Um, and especially today, holding a conversation around um, intersectional grief across power and privilege and how our identities as managers and as leaders deeply influence the way that we are able to engage in the conversation. That is a particular conversation that we're having in part one, because we can't have anything else if we're not attuned and aware of how our own, the skin that we're in and our own access to privilege influences the way that we validate or invalidate grief that other people hold. That's part of grief one, that's part of series one. Um, I wanna norm up that there will be um, moments and opportunities throughout to engage with yourself. So all throughout, I'm going to be, we're gonna have quiet moments for you to go into the starter kit and have some reflection and ways to write. So I really wanna welcome you to have something that you can write on your phone, computer, et cetera, for that reflection, which is a deep practice of grief leadership. As I mentioned, um, the starter kit for mental health and school mental health leadership is the foundational text for the whole series. Please have access to it today. And um, we're part of what I'm hoping to do as a facilitator is double track, create learning for us in the space, but also model the way that you can bring this starter kit to your own teams. So double track. Here are a couple, three other pieces to hold space for ourselves and each other during this time. 
I know that we have a lot going on. I have a lot going on. I personally just put everything on focus mode and got all the windows closed down so that I can literally look at you and the squares and be here now. So I really invite you as much as possible to try and give yourself the um, kind of oxygenated space of really just focusing on the conversation this moment. Um, I'm going to norm up that sharing is not mandatory. It's much richer when all of you do share, but the work can really happen individually and, and reflectively as well. And then this is a really big foundational one, which is the number, the third one, that we're going to recognize and own that no two grief experiences are the same and, and that grief is not held equally in our culture and our workplaces. So we have to have that agreement as we move through the conversation so that we don't get into grief war, politic, oppression, um, or competition of whose grief is more, is worse, harder, more prioritized than others. Um, and that we approach this work of grief, grief readiness through an equality lens and also an equity lens. We're gonna start off with, uh, with three parts. The first is grief readiness, the basics. So here we are, y'all. We are going to move into a time where we can create shared language. I shared earlier that I'm a griever and also grief ally and grief justice champion, and I hope all of you are as well. Uh, and it's because I hold many different identities. I hold myself as a young person who experienced deep loss um, and my life after loss experiences in the workplace never felt um, free and able to be what they needed to be. I then was in school work as a teacher and teacher organizer and youth organizer for many years and experienced the student and experienced student death a lot in my early life uh, and saw that there were some resources that schools ex received to support students navigating the loss of their friends and their cousins, but basically nothing for us as educators and school mental health folks. And the other piece that I carry is as a coworker and a manager and a leader and having teammates who experience lots of loss, um, either in the past or in the present and, um, and currently witnessing in either their families, communities, or internationally, deep devastation, loss, and state station violence. So here's what we know for sure, for sure. That loss, no matter if it's a person, if it's an experience of culture, if it's a loss of a pet, if it's a loss of a role, it is an exposure. <laughs> it surfaces the values, the fascia, and the tenets of what an organization is, and it will expose you and me for who we are as leaders and who we are as managers. It is a time both birth and death are the windows to our raw humanity. So how we hold them in our mental health and school health leadership is essential. I want to share a little bit about when I'm saying the word loss, Throughout this series, I'm really going to be using kind of the, the case of a, of a supporting an employee who has lost someone in their life. But we know that loss comes in many, many, many different forms. Of course, it's related to death, but it is also relationships and plans. How many of us have worked for school systems or agencies or organizations where we thought we were working for someone and then the next month we were working for someone else or we had a vision for what it was going to be, and then in six months later, there was a whole new reorg and restructure. So there are so many different ways we can experience and, uh, and relate to the word loss. I wanna acknowledge that um, just like we'll talk about in a little bit, that all of us have our grief bias, just like we've implicit bias, we have grief bias. We also have loss bias. So it's an important question for us in this moment as we start to talk about how loss can come in different forms, which losses you have most connection to, which losses your teammates have most connection to, and where there might be sharedness and where there might be difference. I also know that grief and loss can come in many different forms. At the very end of the deck, there are some shared definitions for uh, many different types of grief, anticipatory grief, disenfranchised grief, um, and delayed grief. I want to name that um, that's actually that's a whole whole body of work that we can get into and we've got a lot of resources to help you learn more about the kind of the explicit different types of grief but I have a I have a belief and a knowing that for this conversation about being grief ready 
even just the knowing that there are many types of grief in itself is being grief ready. <laughs> that to know that in terms of anticipatory grief, that you've got colleagues who have family members who have terminal illnesses. You have colleagues who have family members who live in communities that because of structural racism and violence and oppression, sit in a knowing that someone might be killed any day. For all of us who work in schools, because of the current culture of gun violence and school shootings, we have a quiet or a loud internal voice wondering all the time when it might happen, right? So that's a, those are examples of anticipatory. There's a couple other uh, languages that you might see here that I want to name, and the others are this idea of cumulative grief. Cumulative grief, sometimes I think of it as, um, <laughs> uh, so right now I, I, have a, I have a new kid. I have, a, I have a almost I have a little over a one-year-old, and she really likes all of her noodles separated from her peas. She gets very mad when the noodles and peas are mashed together, and she can't take them out apart. In some ways, that is like cumulative grief. We can't parcel out, is my grief due to my COVID loss, my, my role loss, my divorce, my... Uh, the death of what's happening around the world, right? that they're all mashed up and um, hard to parcel out. And I would argue that for us as managers, that sometimes the hardest type of grief to support because we want something that is concrete and in front of us that we can fix and solve. Part of what it invites us to do as grief leaders is actually know that the main basic tenet of being a grief ready leader in our mental health or school mental health workforces is knowing that we are not there to fix or solve. We are there to witness, hold space, and stand with and alongside our colleagues to then um, create experiences where they can take ownership and charge, and we can take ownership and charge of our own experiences. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So here are a couple, a couple um, stats. We like the stats, and these. This is actually um, stats from. These are stats from the New York Life Foundation's survey, I think back in 2019, so this is pre-COVID. I'm gonna show you another one um, after COVID. But especially when we're talking about losses all around us, I wanna name, like, just let's think about that, right? That we've got many of us who are experiencing relationship death. We have many of us who are experiencing parent or sibling death before they're 20, which means they're coming into the workforce with a loss experience. We know, and I saw that so many of you are involved in postvention work, we know that the third leading cause of death right now for young people is needing and choosing to leave this world. The piece that often doesn't get talked about for those of us in mental health and school mental health is the experience of pregnancy loss, of, uh, of, of fertility loss, of identity that is wrapped around the embodied experience of bringing life into this world. Uh, and one in five cis women experience miscarriage and that doesn't account for their partners and partner grief of what it like means to be, um, be alongside someone in that. So I wanna name that all of these types of losses are present for us, especially if we are leading workforces that have been historically feminized, that we're, if they're, we're leading communities in, uh, and teams that most likely have and will experience grief while we are leading them. So this is, um, these are a couple other stats about the, the role of mental health after the pandemic and through the pandemic, right? Some of us argue we're after it, some of us argue we're still in it. So we know that almost 80 per 84 percent of the workforce said that in COVID, one of the most common um, elements of work-life work life hardship was actually their mental health at work. Um, and I just want to name that if we think about that um, and we look at that teal circle right there, that one half of the study's respondents left their work because of mental health needs. And that is particularly disaggregated across age and, and generation that our young, our young folks leave work when they do not feel mentally, mentally, mental health healthfully, mentally healthfully cared for. Um, and that's a particular stat for us to hold as we think about new social workers, new therapists, new teachers in the work. Um, and for us, we're, if we came from a generation where we didn't talk about mental health at work, which grief is a part of, 
but now we are leading a team where all I want to talk about is grief at work, <laughs> that might bring us into some pretty intense challenge for us um, in, in growing in, in our, in our grief leadership, right? Okay, so I'm sharing all of these stats, not because they are radical or new information to all of us, but A, for some of us to experience validation, right? I know for myself, when I experienced pregnancy loss at work, I felt really alone and silenced and invisible, even though I was in a workplace that talked about mental health all the time, right? So some of it's just to receive validation that what you're going through, have gone through, or might go through is, is real. And it's also, again, a call to why this being grief ready, not just trauma informed, but grief ready is, ne is necessary in our work. So now is a moment of pause for our first window of reflection. And I'm going to invite you to either turn to page 13 in the starter kit or just free write. When you think of the losses that your team is grieving, what comes up for you? When you think about the type of losses that your team is grieving, you can define who your team is. It can be your, your team you supervise, the team that you're on, your organization, your agency. What are the losses that your team is grieving? And I'm actually going to go back to that slide with the types of losses really quickly, because um, that might help us. Types of losses is your team grieving. So as we start to see the types of loss that our teams and our colleagues are grieving, I invite you to start to think about what types of loss do you feel more steady in supporting as a manager and a leader? And what types of loss actually edge you? Or maybe that you haven't even considered or thought about before. And those are the types of losses to hold in this, in this conversation today and in this series. So like I said, we're still in part one when we're creating shared language. We're gonna take the next couple moments to be discerning about when we say grief and when we say trauma or we say bereavement, what we actually mean. So part of um, part of the conversation is like, we hear so many different words in our workplace. And my invitation for you is actually in thinking about the kinds of losses that your teams hold, what would it be like to actually have a conversation with those that you manage and supervise to say, what does loss mean to you? It might mean something to me. I might think that you're experiencing loss, but actually I'm just mapping on my own schema, my own world belief onto you, um, right? And so I wanna take a moment to talk of the difference between grief and loss and trauma and the intersections and the divergences. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how is grief similar and different to trauma, right? All right, so Here's what we know in the world of crises. And I'm using the word crises to relate to things happening to us that overwhelm our coping system. That might mean our internal nervous system coping system. It might mean our organizational coping system. It means a moment where we go, whoa, I am not ready, wasn't ready, um, and don't have the resources, both emotional, uh, financial, psychological, structural, to respond to the moment of what it's asking me. So as we know, and we many of us are deeply rooted in the work of trauma and trauma-informed spaces, that trauma can mean an event or an experience or an effect, and that it's really up to us and up to each other of how we use that word trauma. I might, my colleague or someone I supervise might come to me and say, oh, I went through this thing, and I might say, whoa, that feels super traumatic. They may not identify with the word, and that's actually their choice. That's their choice, their definition, their lived experience. So again, this is how do we manage and hold teams where there are multiple definitions living in the same conversation. It's so human, so complex, and so real. But here are the following knowings. We know that grief doesn't always involve trauma but that trauma often involves some sort of grief. And when I'm using the word grief, I'm particularly thinking about an ongoing or evolving experience, both in our brains, in our hearts, in our bodies that are related to loss, primary, secondary, um, but that most importantly relate to our sense of self, security, and our worldview, our belief system about how the world works. So either when, when I was um, in my doctoral work and I was studying the impact of student death, and I was in conversations with teachers of what it meant when their students were killed due to gun, gun violence, there were some teachers who said that experience validated and affirmed what I knew and believed in my childhood, 
that someone was going to die, nothing is predictable, and that I'm always waiting for someone to be to not show up the next day. And there were other teachers who said, I have never experienced gun violence before. It ruptured my sense of safety, my sense of um, my sense of security, and it created a lot of unpredictability, right? This, yeah, so those are two examples of how world, one event can impact and experience worldview and influence our grief. Um, the word trauma is usually associated with harm, and grief is often associated with loss. Both okay. And that we know that loss doesn't always involve trauma, but loss always usually involves some degree of grief. <laughs> so I might, right? So many of you were talking about the losses in, in chat, but I might be experiencing financial loss or the transition of a colleague. That may not, the, the transition of a colleague in itself may not be uh, traumatic. I might experience loss or it was traumatic because there was no conversation about it. There was no preparation for it. And suddenly the person who I trusted was gone. Right? So same event, different trauma, grief experiences. The piece that feels really important and what's so powerful about all of you showing up for today in this series is that where we are in our culture right now is that trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive work has really and rightly so gotten a lot of attention and funding and validation. We have not yet done that with grief work, which is quite um, fascinating, particularly because we just went through and are going through deep collective experiences of grief and loss. So there's still something culturally that is blocking us from embracing this idea of grief sensitivity as a cornerstone to our leadership work. Um, and my belief is because it unearths and evokes the scariest experiences for us. It's so scary that we don't wanna center it in our practice. That's part of what we're doing today. Okay, a couple more pieces around our social and cultural belief systems. Um, so it's often the experience of grief follows loss and it's the grief is, uh, Dr. David Schoenfeld talk, teaches and talks about grief being the, the outside, the um, words and thoughts and actions that are the externalized experience rooted in the event of the loss. And particularly if we think about schools, many of you are here in school working cultures that we talk often about trauma and grief, having conversations with each other, but the fields in which we are prepped and primed to respond to them are, are usually divorced and siloed. So trauma treatment or childhood grief treatment, both research and practice generally don't overlap. I think a lot about trauma-informed organizational assessments. There's usually zero language about grief. This is what we really want to interrupt. We want to interrupt this idea that grief is personal, that trauma might be um, shared and collective, but that grief is personal and, and doesn't have place or space in our workplace to have conversations around. Um, and that's what we actually really want to interrupt in this work of being a grief-ready manager. Because if we go back to those stats about uh, our mental health and about people who are leaving the profession, it's my belief and from what we're seeing in 2024, that oftentimes when we're talking about mental health challenges with our colleagues, it's actually unvalidated, invalidated, and invisible grief and loss that just isn't named or given the space to be seen and heard and talked about. So all that said, <laughs> uh, it's going to be Wanted, I know, because I want it for myself too, if I put my supervisor and manager hat on, which we'll be putting on this whole series, the way I want to talk about grief as this and trauma as this, and then I can intervene and support someone like that. But we know that it's all messy and not linear and, and usually very mucky, mucky. And it's part of the work of being a grief ready leader is to actually embrace discomfort in sitting with the sticky stuff and sitting with the things that may not have a lot of answers and more messiness and complication. Okay, so in this moment, we're gonna think about what grief readiness might mean for you in your own context and the invitation for us to really sit in our own discomfort so that others can step out of their pain and we can meet in the middle is the work. So let's talk a little bit of now, we, we created some shared language, grief and trauma, and also by the numbers, let's talk a little bit about how being grief sensitive can benefit our team 
Um, and let's move into this definition. So this is our definition that we're offering you, um, which grief readiness in the workplace is to proactively prepare for the impacts of grief experiences on employee well-being and workflow. So you'll notice that some of us have a lot of answers around well-being generally. For my, how, how do I, as a grief ready leader, show up? What are the skills and attributes and knowledge that I need to have to show up? It also, in tandem, well-being and workflow. There are actually some very practical things that for us as managers and leaders and in our organizations, we can do to create structural grief readiness. And that's what we'll be focusing on this whole series, well-being and workflow. We had this quote from our, uh, from our, the folks who engaged in the pilot series in 2021, and I thought it's so necessary, right? My boss told me the nicety, take as much time as I need, but didn't remove any work from my plate. I was afraid to fall behind and risk losing my job since I was now the main breadwinner. I came back to a mountain of tasks that felt insurmountable. So in, this, in that quote in itself, right, we have well-being and workflow paired together. And if you hear those two W's, this whole series in your head, then we've done our job, <laughs> well-being and workflow. It's only so nice to be nice. If we don't change the structures, then we're actually potentially creating even more loss on top of loss. Okay. This series particularly focuses on us as managers and as leaders, right? And so in this moment, I want us to think about when we're thinking about supporting our teams and our organizations, that um, we think about grief readiness, not just in preparing, but also in the welcoming back. Um, and so that whole full circle, full cycle you'll see in the starter kit is not only getting grief ready, but also creating all the different ways that when someone comes back to work, there are the conditions that allow them to be their most human self. Some of us find work to be deeply supportive and a way to get uh, affirmation and affinity and agency. And some of us are finding that actually going to work that doesn't understand grief can be deeply discouraging and isolating, just as we saw. So again, it's a, it's a moment for us to think, to, to expand the both ands, <laughs> that work can be all of the things and or both, both discouraging and an anchor. I want to move into this, this particular conversation as we think about approaching our grief readiness with a power analysis. Right? I said at the very beginning that part of the reason we're having this conversation at the jump, at the initial of our whole series, is, is for us to be attuned and aware of our own grief bias, our own grief narratives, because they will absolutely interact and interfere or inform the way that we validate or invalidate other people's grief, not just in the type of grief, but in the supports that people need when they come back to work or live life after loss. Right? We know, I mean, how many of us are grievers in the room? We know that grief is not just about the moment of loss. It's the reorganization in our lifetimes of what it means to walk in this world without. So we can be reflective um, we can be reflective as an organization in that work. So this next session involves us to do some inner reflection, some some inner um, some inner reflection, and hopefully outer share. Um, some of you have seen both of these visuals before. On the left and on the right are the visuals doing the same exact thing. Some of us like circles, and some of us like scales. So I'm inviting you to find all the different ways in which you might land both in the circle and on the wheel and also on the scales. Like where do you land in your skin color privilege? Where do you land in your gender privilege, in your neurodiversity privilege, in your mental health privilege, in your religion privilege? And when I'm saying privilege, I mean in how your identity is valued and validated in our dominant culture, right? So for me, I have more power in my white bodiedness in my in my skin color. I have more power-ish in my gender identity because I identify as a cis woman. I have a lot of power in my formal education. I am documented. I have citizenship power. Um, I also don't identify as neurodivergent. I identify as neurotypical. But I can go down through this list and think about where I am in, in the privileges in our society. Uh, and I'm naming that because it deeply impacts the way that we come to conversations around being brief ready, right? 
Uh, so I'm inviting you in this moment just to take a, a quiet moment to think about how might one of these elements of privilege influence the way that you connect with someone else's grief and loss? And how might where you land maybe inform what you don't see or may not be aware of with someone else's loss? So part of when we think about grief readiness, the word is often proximity. What we are proximate to heightens our awareness and attunement into what others might be feeling or holding. So I'll give an example, right? Let's talk about potentially talk about uh, number eight and sexual orientation. Um, we know that in this past month, there's a national um, news, and by news, I don't mean to reduce it, but news experience of Next Benedict's um, death in Oklahoma, right? And for those of us who are maybe do not identify as genderqueer, don't have connection to the LGBT queer or non-heteronormative community, um, or who aren't reading the same articles or plugged in, we may not feel or even know that that was happening or that there's an undercurrent of grief with our colleagues who identify as genderqueer or have felt like Next Benedict represents the young person in themselves. Right? So it's an example, again, of how our relationship with identity influences the way that we might be tuned in and plugged into how our teammates are holding on. So. Again, when we're managing or working in an organization, we are working with people who might have some similar lived experience to us and often will have very different lived experience with us. So it inherently puts us in the necessity to think about the different experiences and how people are moving through the world. This is gonna be a foreground to this whole series. There's um, going to be a, a series, particularly when we think about literal communication and management tools um, and structural benefit leave. And we'll give examples about how maybe our different religious frameworks or mental health frameworks or, um, or gender frameworks influence the way that we think about how we should grieve at work or how we should talk about grief at work. So this speaks to what we were just holding. This is the question for all of us to sit in quietness with. Who around us may be grieving and what is different about the ways that they grieve? We might have colleagues that are deeply rooted in loss and violence happening somewhere not in front of us. And that's on their mind all the time right now. Right? We also know that not only is grief and trauma individualized in the way that it's experienced and embodied individually, but also collectively and in our communities, again, due to structural experiences of oppression and inaccess to healing. So if you are someone, I'm gonna go back, if you are someone who like me holds a lot of privileges and power on that left-hand scale, this is an opportunity for you and me to do some step in and out of what might we need to unlearn and learn differently about how our colleagues are grieving and life after loss in their own body, in their own experiences. And if you're someone who experiences uh, this chart very differently, what might you need to advocate for, call in, interrupt, and, and know in your being that is valid in a way that you may not get from dominant culture and society? This again speaks to this question of when we think about structural just systems of structural oppression and access to power and identity, how employees' experiences would be different if their vocalness was different. Some of us have employees that are really vocal about what they need. Some of us have employees that are much quieter and internal, and that might shift and change the way that we acknowledge, validate, or inform their grief. Same with tenure or seniority, right? If we've got older colleagues who may not have tenure, they may feel um, not fully safe to share where they are in their grief journey for at risk of being fired or, um, or, or experiences of ageism. So we're gonna stick with these, this line of thinking um, and I'm going to invite you to think about what would culturally humble grief support look like, feel like, and sound like in your work context. Culturally humble grief support, right? Not only is the conversation how to be gr grief ready, but how can we be culturally humbly grief ready? Um, and cultural humility doesn't just mean I learn about other cultures. It actually means I am clear and committed to understanding my access to power, power differential, 
and how for me, if I have more access than others, how I'm doing active interruption in that experience. It's already time to move into closing. This is just our session one. I hope that this has gotten you excited for sessions two, three, and four. I want to close with the a couple of uh, a couple integration moments. I want to um, name this beautiful teaching that uh, Naomi Remen wrote in Francois Matthews' The Cost of Caring Workbook, which I highly recommend. Naomi Remen writes. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to walk through water without getting wet. This sort of denial is no small matter. The way we deal with loss shapes our capacity to be present to life more than anything else. The way we protect ourselves from loss might be the way in which we distance ourselves from life. We burn out not because we don't care, but because we don't grieve. We burn out because we've allowed our hearts to become so full of loss that we have no room left to care. The image on the right is um, the vision, the literal vision <laughs> uh, that I saw walking the beach in Stinson Beach in Northern California um, when I was immersed in my, my own grief related to my pregnancy loss. And there was these, that vibrant rainbow in the sky and in the sand. And uh, it's an image that stays with me as I think about how we as colleagues can be reflective hope windows for our other colleagues that are in moments of deep despair, that we can hold both beauty and pain for them together. So here's the sentence, right? Like all of you here today, you're already doing the work. You're already grief ready because you already are saying, yes, I know that I have to be for myself and for others. Um, and there are in the starter kit and in the universe and in the resources posted, so many checklists and binders for what to do. Part of this series is holding the what to do and the how to be, both of those two together, right? Well-being and workflow. Mm, someone's offering on joy and sorrow. The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes, thank you. So in this moment, I'm gonna offer a quiet moment of integration. We know that many of you are moving on to the next thing, the next Zoom, the next conversation, the next client, the next pickups of from daycare, the next, right? But just in this moment in transition to have a quiet moment to reflect, what is maybe one thing that you received from the last collective 60 minutes of our life? What did you bring in yourself? And what still feels unfinished? I just, I want to offer if someone, if you, if one of you had said that, the reminder, let go of self-centering, I want to offer that it's a both and. It's a warm embrace of self-centering and a warm embrace of recentering and, right? Self and other centering. I'm going to repeat a sentence that a young person in Louisiana who I got to work with many years ago said when we were talking about what does it mean for adults to show up for you when you're feeling pain? And they said, it means when adults step into discomfort and I can step out of my pain and we can meet in the middle. Such a beautiful image. Next week, we focus on the following four things. How grief sensitive is you are, is, are you and your organization? And that will actually be tangible, concrete, self-reflective questions that we can ask ourselves and think about our organization, whether that's our team or our system. Many of you oftentimes say, but I'm not a leader. I'm not a manager. I'm not the director. I'm not HR. So we're actually gonna be talking about what is in our sphere of influence because newsflash, you have influence. Anyone who you engage with is impacted by the way that you hold yourself and hold space for others. We're gonna study the stages of grief readiness as an organization, and then invite you into what research you might engage in to get even more grief ready. Mm -hmm. So how grief sensitive are you? What's your sphere of influence stages and do your research? I really want to welcome you to, to nestle in and cozy up with that starter kit for grief readiness. Uh, and you'll see that there are some live sections of today that, I, that we double clicked in um, to make them come alive. Uh, at the end of the deck, you've got a ton of resources. Uh, and if you need any of them walked through, talked about, gone through, please email us and I can stay or I can stay on afterwards and talk through them. Um, I want to particularly highlight uh, Grieving While Black, an anti-racist take on oppression and sorrow. Um, that is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. 
um, that particularly for those of you who uh, don't identify as Black, that we can do some deep learning with. Um, I also, at the very bottom, there's a book called Leading Through Loss. I'm going to show it right here. It's a real book, um, and it's a beautiful one by Margot um, Falkis, I think is how they pronounce their last name. Leading Through Loss, Acknowledged Grief, Brave Leaders, Compassionate Culture. So lovely, lovely, lovely book. And then, as I said earlier, I've got some working definitions at the very end in case you would like to do some more study with the different types of grief. Uh, I want to name, and we, we also have a ton of other no-cost, completely open to the public uh, workshop series through the Pacific Southwest MHEGC. So we're starting on March 20th, a whole series of workshops on trauma for approaches for school communities. So join us. Um, we also have a whole series happening right now for those of you who are Spanish speaking, provider platicas for clinicians who are Spanish speaking. And um, we have a beautiful series led by Oriana Edis on youth and young adult mental health services um, and how they can be more healing centered. And of course, that second one is ours. That's the series. That's the series. And all of this is in the deck that you received.